bem-vindo ou bem-vinda a mais um episódio do nosso Autenticidades. Hoje de um jeito diferente, por duas razões. Quem está aqui comigo não é Adriano Lisieiro, é Flávia Saad, minha parça de Tudo vida. Tudo bem? Pela primeira vez aqui, né? Pela Flávia? primeira vez falando de cidades, né? Muito bom. E eu estou aqui com outra pessoa, direto de uma cidade que eu adoro, que é Nova York. Eu não minto pra ninguém, né, gente? Que é o Lev Moscow. Did, did I say it right? You did, you said oh, okay. it right. <risos> Perfect pronunciation. E, gente, vocês vão ver aqui... A gente dá uma pastada, né? Pra fazer um podcast em inglês. <risos> Pela primeira né? vez, várias primeiras vezes hoje, estamos fazendo nosso primeiro podcast em inglês. For the first time in the history of this country, <risos> né? <risos> so, um, eu vou apresentar o Leve, né? Em... In em português mesmo, né? E depois a gente vai começar um bate-papo em inglês, mas vai estar tá tanto legendado, se você tá vendo no YouTube, como depois a gente vai fazer um compilado para quem tá assistindo a gente entender melhor o que o Leve tá falando já em português, porque ele tem muito conteúdo interessante para passar pra gente, uma discussão, né? Que é interessante a gente ter a partir do ponto de vista de quem... De falar de cidades brasileiras, de quem não é daqui. Então, o Leve, ele é novaiorquino, como eu disse. Ele é pai de dois filhos. E ele é professor de História e Economia no Ensino Público de Nova York. E o Leve, ele também toca e é criador de um podcast que fala sobre História e Economia com um propósito muito interessante. De ser algo que tem muito a ver com o que eu e a Flávia fazemos que eu e o Lisieiro fazemos e que nós fazemos nesse ecossistema aqui de esse hub, que é desmistificar temas difíceis, né? A gente fala, faz isso aqui de cidades, mas o Leve faz muito, né? Ele, 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 ele realmente faz um trabalho né, de educação ligada à economia fora daquele circuito da mídia é, convencional, E é né? também um, um ponto de vista bacana porque ele tá vivendo aquilo, né? Então ele traz as vivências dele para esse podcast e não é, de um lugar de acadêmico ou, ou algo assim, né? E a outra coisa é que o Leve também ele, ele fala muito de economia política para o ensino médio universitário, para educar os professores e eu já ouvi podcast dele e ele dialoga muito com geógrafos como o nosso co-host aqui, Adriano Lisieiro. Um beijo Lisieiro para você. E a gente aproveitou essa passagem do Leve aqui por Santos, né? Ele não mora aqui, ele não mora no Brasil, ele mora lá em Nova York, já morou em outras cidades, a gente vai falar sobre isso, para a gente gravar esse podcast, esse episódio especial aqui do Autenticidades. Então, bora, Flávia. Para quem não bora conhece lá. você, Flávia, você quer se apresentar em inglês? Lá, em, em, é, inglês. Come... em inglês, em inglês. Esse, esse é um desafio, hein? Todo dia é diferente aqui no Juicy Hub. Hoje, eu acordei e falei assim, nossa, vou apresentar um podcast em inglês. I'm Flavia Saad, I'm a journalist and I'm head of content of Juicy Santos, which we co-founded uh, 12 years ago, um, to try to make a transformation and to try to make our city better for us and for the next generations. This bond us, right? At, at somehow, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Lev, I'm so happy that you are here. Thank you. I present uh, yourself to our audience mm -hmm. in Portuguese. Did you get it? I got I got 99% of it, yes. <laughs> Amazing. He's <laughs> fluent, guys. And uh, we, are, we are being like a bit ashamed of talking in English. So Lev is going to talk Portuguese here too, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> probably not, actually. <laughs> <laughs> don't be don't be shy. No, I'm so shy when it comes to this. <laughs> That's nice. So, Lev, thank you so much for our last minute uh, invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, you're a podcaster. You are really good. <laughs> you, it, it, it's like thank you. Mag magnetizing content for us, uh, thank right? Thank you very much. It's really nice. It, it's like, it's sad that it's not in Portuguese. We should do something about this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to do, but I, I, my Portuguese is is not very good actually. But your content is really good for Brazilians, yeah, and e you. even not not um, it's it's like really important to our leaderships in politics to hear what you are saying over there. And I'm almost sure they don't speak English because <laughs> only three percent of Brazilians speaks English. You wow. know that? Wow! Did you know I did, that? I did not know that. It's crazy. No, that is very yeah. that is surprising. It's really crazy. <laughs> so we have a lot of things to talk and we have like short time, but I would love to start this conversation about your perception about our Brazilian cities. So mm. I know you travel a lot when you come here, mm -hmm. right? You went to places that I've never been, for example. So what 
what's her what what Brazilian cities have you already been? Um, well, so I went to Salvador uh, 21 years ago. Okay. Um, that was the first time I was in Brazil. This was right at the time when Brazil won the World Cup. They, I think <laughs> they beat Germany, and I was there for that. That was really fun. And um, got to travel a little bit around Bahia, and then we went to Rio. A friend of mine uh, and I went to Rio that same trip just for a week. And... Um, And then since I met my wife a few years ago, we've come to Santos now three times, of course, Sao Paulo um, and the, the North Coast a bit uh, and uh, Parachi. Um, oh, we went to Minas. We went to Minas last, mm -hmm. last summer to Belo Horizonte. You went to your We right? did, and Belo Horizonte and uh, Oro Preto. That's cool. And what's your favorite city when you need to choose some city in Brazil? What, what's your perception? Uh, Well, I have to say, I really, really do like Santos. And every time we leave here, I always tell Amanda, you know, we could, we could, uh, we could think about retiring here. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful place. And I think we're going to get to this stuff when we talk about Jacobs, I think. But just in terms of scale, in terms of size, it's a, it's a much more comfortable city than, than well, for sure, than New York and Sao Paulo. Yeah. So, um It feels more like, uh, again, big differences, but a place like the size of Amsterdam or the size of Florence, um, those are cities that I that I love. And one of the things I appreciate about Santos is the is the compactness of it and um, density, as Jane yes. Jacobs always the, the say. Density, right? yeah. Um, so you know, I, I don't know. Like on a scale of one to ten, what do I think about these things? You know, I think it depends on on what we're what we're looking for. I I guess I can, and maybe it's no fun to do, but I can kind of start with the criticisms of the city, um, because there's just many, many wonderful things about it, from the you know from the beach to the people to the food to having family here. Um, but I think what always you know the reason we don't move here is, and I think this is a problem even more so with with of the cities I've been to here with Rio and, and Sao Paulo and, and Salvador. But so much of the space is is privatized. And the public space that does exist here is a, it's small and um, it seems to me to be concentrated, you know, on the beach. And a way, and also not very well taken care of. Not well taken care. Like we 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 go to you know Channel Three here with our with our daughter who's two, and you know there's a very small playground there on Channel Three, mm -hmm. and um, you know nothing. It's all broken, mm -hmm. and this would cost you know nothing to fix. Um, but it just it just sort of seems forgotten. Um, so the public space is is something that I really I sort of miss. And one of the things that Amanda, my wife, always says when we're in New York is how she appreciates being able to go to a park with our mm -hmm. daughter and just, you know, sort of spend the day there. And parks either seem to be in short supply or there's this question always mm -hmm. of security. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for example, we find that when I am not on the beach Like, let's say it's a rainy day and I need to do something with my daughter who is, you know, who's got a lot of energy to burn. You know, we, we go to the mall and there's these yeah. like, you know, jungle gyms, playrooms that you pay yeah. for, which are actually, you know, quite expensive, um, even for American, by American standards. And, you know, you're in this secure space that's totally, you know, totally inauthentic and artificial. Yeah, yeah. And that's not, you know, I don't think it's good for the, the individual. I don't think it's good for mm -hmm. the... The citizenry. Um, so it's the beach is wonderful. Uh, there, there just seems to be so much more that could be done with the space here that exists. Um, I'm thinking about down by Channel One. There's that new park. There's a little basketball court. And I'm, I'm interested in basketball. I play. And, and we we went down there with our daughter to go play in the in the playground. And then I went to the basketball court. And there's, you know, 20 guys waiting to play on a very small mm -hmm. court. And these are all, you know, these are all teenagers who love the sport and want something to do. And there's just one hoop. Mm -hmm. This, again, feels like a pretty low cost way yeah. to improve the quality of life in the city. And um, that's 
that's not here. So a lot of what is here is is shopping. Like I think there are yeah. like three big malls that you know shopping that's, centers that we go to and that's an outstanding point, right? Yeah. It's it's like um, maybe if you come to from São Paulo, mm -hmm. you wouldn't see this as a problem, mm -hmm. but as you were because. This is a São Paulo's lifestyle, right? Yeah. Yeah. People go to the São Paulo way of life. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we are not yeah, being like uh, we're not uh, we're is, not is so our, much like that here in Santos. No, but, but, but we are know. not criticizing. Yeah. It's like uh, we need to understand how the city is built because the mindset is built through this, right? So, but someone that comes from São Paulo maybe doesn't seem as a problem. We see this as a problem, you see this as a problem. And and something that is really nice that we talk here is like uh, uh, Adriano, he has a amazing project that is called Geopanoramas. And he see and, and, and he publish images from the, the cities and the places from above, mm. right? And it was something interesting, another perspective, because he he taught us like to think about it. And I've been in London um, some some weeks ago, and something really interesting is that when you see London from above, you see like a lot of green spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Mauricio, my husband, he said to him, let's compare to Sao Paulo. It is crazy because London has a lot of green spaces, well distributed and etc. cetera. Yeah. It's like New York doesn't have, we have Central Park and in other neighborhoods, we have like these green spaces. But Sao Paulo, it's crazy. You don't see nothing like this. Mm -hmm. That's why people go to shoppings, for example. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's, a, it's an amazing point. Uh, you were going to say that? For, for me, the lack of, of options for kids and for families, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, is very restrictive for our uh, interaction opportunities. Yeah. Exactly. It, it uh, prevents us, prevents little kids from two-year-olds to teenagers to even adults to interact as social human beings, to talk. Uh, old people, the elderly also, they don't have anywhere to to spend their time yeah. they have very uh niched places uh, or they just stay at home yeah yeah that's right and i think where you when you go outside here where you can spend time together is is built around consumption so cafes or restaurants you've got yeah. to, you've got to always be spending money mm -hmm. to spend time with each other unless of course and then this is the the wonderful thing about santos unless of course you're on the beach yeah And and then that really does feel like, you know, a very democratic space. I I first found, uh, and we can talk about Jacobs whenever you want, but I first <laughs> found Jane Jacobs when I was in graduate school in in Holland. And it was in the context of writing a master's thesis. And um, I came across her actually after I read Teresa Caldera, who is a Brazilian She's a sociologist, um, but a Brazilian academic who wrote a, a book called City of Walls about Sao Paulo. And she was really, you know, contrasting the, the built environment of Sao Paulo to Jacob's ideal city. And they couldn't be sort of more, you know, further apart. So you find Jane Jacobs through a Brazilian author? Is yeah, that? Exactly. Oh, my God. Yeah. This is a plot twist. So <laughs> oh, my so, God. So she And she actually is referencing... Uh, Caldera is referencing this guy named Mike Davis all the time. And Mike Davis wrote a book called City of Courts. It's, it's description of L.A.'s built spaces, mm -hmm. its architecture. It, it's what he calls defensible architecture, mm -hmm. the high walls, the uh, the sidewalks, which are empty. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there's an analog there between between um, Sao Paulo and Los Angeles. And um, both of those models are, are really far from what I think Jacob's had had in yeah. mind so yeah it, it sort of was like i read i read davis then caldera and then came across jacobs oh my god this for me is a big plot twist because <laughs> I, i had an imaginary that i i find jane jacobs okay let's 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 give let's a rewind. step yeah let's give us a step back mm. and say tell our audience you this is our okay. camera all right Who is Jane Jacobs? Okay, so Jane Jacobs uh, was a, an American and a, a Canadian activist and uh, intellectual and scholar. Um, but she's most famous for, she worked on a bunch of different projects. She's most mm -hmm. famous for a book um, called uh, The Life and Death of uh, 
American cities. Great American cities. Great American cities. And in the book, she, and she's really, I think, coming from the vantage of living in Soho or Greenwich Village mm-hmm. in New York, which at the time was uh, very bohemian. And we can talk about what changed in Soho and Greenwich Village since then. Um, but, you know, small streets and what she calls mixed use spaces. Mm-hmm. So apartment buildings with businesses inside. And for her, Greenwich Village is sort of a last bastion. What was happening in the 1950s and 60s in the post-war period mm-hmm. in the United States was the suburbanization, of course. But in turn, what that did to cities is it, it transformed cities into these places where you know people go to work. And so there's these downtown I mean, Sao Paulo's a bit like this, and I, I understand mm-hmm. it's changing yeah. now, but there's a downtown center where it's all office buildings, and it's great during the day, of course, but at night, yeah. there's nobody there. It's it's not populated. And then, of course, what's happening in the suburbs is that during the day, they're empty, no one's there, and they return mm-hmm. home at night. And so what she was saying is, like, actually, you know, we need to build our future cities like, like Soho so that they are, she has these a few key points. One is that they are human-scaled, so we're talking about three or four story buildings, which by the way, Santos does great yeah. in that regard. Yeah. Although, you know, there's now these new condos which are very, very tall. Uh, until the, the real estate guys came and, and killed these buildings, yeah. right? and it's very sad to see some of these most, some of these gorgeous buildings in, in the state that they are kind of falling apart in the center, but also just, it, we're in Channel 3 right now in this neighborhood, yeah. you walk by these gorgeous buildings and they're, you know, they're empty and they're decrepit and, you know, it's, it's a shame. Um, so human scale, a mixed use space. You never want a building mm-hmm. to just be one thing. And it, connected to that is uh, I, people's eyes on the street. Mm-hmm. And so you, if you're concerned, uh, you know, and by the way, in New York City in the 1960s and when I grew up in the 1990s, it, it didn't have crime rates like Sao Paulo, but it was very, you know, very mm-hmm. dangerous city. No, um, Brand Park was like we call in Brazil like a Cracolândia. Right. Brand Park, the place where everybody says, "Oh, public library, so cool." It was like a, the Cracolândia in Sao Paulo. Yeah, I mean, look, I just to step back for a sec. I grew up in the Bronx. In I was born in 1979, and we uh, went to school, you know, in the Bronx in public school, and then in East Harlem um, public school, and. Uh, you know, people have all heard of South Bronx. If anything, if anything, East Harlem was in in worse shape during the '80s and '90s, and it was because of the the crack epidemic. And I mm-hmm. remember very, very clearly. You know, we'd go out to the playground out behind the school, and it was it's it's hard to describe this today because you've both been to New York and seen what it's like. But not an inch of space on the playground was not covered by a crack vial. A uh, little plastic crack mm-hmm. vial. And so we used to, you know, sweep them aside to play kickball or basketball. We would fill up our backpacks, and we were seven years old, with these crack vials and then, oh like, throw water at each other with them. I mean, it's just like, it was just, and we knew what they were, mm-hmm. but it was just, you know, it was just like the life um, at the time. So, anyway, it just in, the reason I say that is to say that, you know, I think a lot of Brazilians might say, well, it's nice in New York to have public space, but here in Brazil, we've got the security problem. And I think, mm-hmm. That's not something to ignore, but just to recognize that part of Caldera's point is that when you build, there's a couple of ways to defend, let's say, or make your city safe. When you build high walls with barbed wire and security cameras, that's one way to do it. But it's not uh, welcoming. And it's, she makes the argument, it's actually like, not very good for democracy. And I think for the reason, you know, the point that you made about not being able to communicate with each other and not just to communicate with people in your friend group, but communicate across classes. It's very difficult to do. Um, to mix up mixed, yeah, people. Sure. I mean, it's not, and so it's not democratic. And so you understand yeah. why we have some of the problems with democracy. And also, it, uh, you don't get to actually see, the, the people don't get to actually see what's going on. Uh, behind the walls yeah. and behind uh, and through the cameras. So when you have exactly what you said that, that Jane Jacobs uh, talked about, like the people's eyes on the street, like there's a hole in our in my street or uh, something's not working or something is not right. That it's that that's why through the the Hitler's time in Germany, 
every time the guards see three people on the corner talking, it's yeah. it's like they did. It, 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 it wasn't allowed. Them to, to, yeah. To okay. Uh, uh, spread. Spread, yeah. <laughs> yeah spread. Exactly. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Uh, th- that is a, a, a huge problem when people doesn't connect, doesn't share spaces. It's 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 a huge problem, and and it drives like it's bad for the cities. It's bad for the economics. It's bad for democracy. It's bad for everything. It's good for only one thing, maybe the extractivists or the high performance capitalism, right? Yeah. That's and for the mainness for of that. the status quo. Yeah, right? exactly, so, exactly. So things remain always the same. Yeah, but exactly. I, think, I think even for people who think that this is benefiting them, that it creates the kind of stability and safety, mm-hmm. it's, um, the problem is, is that they're also suffering that they are inside, they're stuck inside their houses. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you know, what do you do? You, you watch TV all the mm-hmm. time or your kids yes. are on screens all the time. Um, so there, there's so many people who suffer from this. I would say, um, first and foremost, the poor. But it's not like, you know, why do the, I always think about this question of why do wealthy Brazilians, as soon as they get, you know, any time off, go fly to Europe or the United States. And mm-hmm. it's because they actually, like, they want to feel safe. They want, yeah. they want to be able... I mean, Europe is so wonderful in many ways, and we can talk about, you know, some examples of places that have really tried to do what Jacobs is, is prescribing for us. I mean, it's wonderful because it's more democratic. Mm-hmm. And wealthy Brazilians like that. And you wonder how we can make... Brazil more democratic, uh, but 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 do you think uh, it's something maybe that Adriano would ask you? But do you think the Jane Jacobs ideas would work in Brazil? Would work like because our our cities grow in another way. So Ad- Adriano always said about the macrocephalia urbana. I don't know how to translate this, but it's like the. How is microcephalia? Um, how, how, I don't know. I don't it's like know. this. Uh, uh, I, I, I would, I would, Look okay, it up. Yeah. let's, <laughs> let's macrocephalia <laughs> translate. So it's something that the cities grow in a different way. Yeah. So do you think it's still, uh, uh, it's an opinion. It's not like a yeah. future exercise. So what, what do you think about it? It would be uh, applicable to Brazil? Well, okay. I mean, I think that this is where, um, and I think the example of Amsterdam is actually a good, it's a good example. Urban macrocephaly. Have you heard about it? Heard okay. it. No, but... Adrian, you should, you should, <laughs> we should talk about it, only one episode about it, okay? Yeah. So if you look at, go on Google and look at, you know, pictures of Amsterdam in the 1960s, what you'll see is you'll see, you know, the same kind of canal streets, tiny streets, but with tons of car traffic. And you also start to see the process of suburbanization in Mm -hmm. Amsterdam. And it starts to be one of these places where people are commuting to work. It looks nothing at all like the way you imagine Amsterdam today, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, thousands of bikes on the street, very few cars, um, public squares, which is a big part of what Jacobs is talking about. And so the question is, you know, how do we get from, you know, Amsterdam in the 1960s, which is very much moving on an American model, Mm -hmm heavily influenced by the United States in the post-war period. And how does it become what it is today? And there's this, there's two big things that happen. One of them is is called COBRA. So Copenhagen, Brussels, mm-hmm. and Amsterdam. And it's this radical, basically anarchist movement, which is trying to figure out how to what are the what are the big problems? Well one is 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 car is car oriented cities, which frankly Every Brazilian mm-hmm. city I've been to, mm-hmm. Monsanto should not be a car-oriented city. It's a but it was. And, like, it, is, and it is. I mean, the, from what I see. It's some, some data about uh, it's Santos about this. In 1995, every city, the, the average cars per person in Santos was 1.8. Wow. <laughs> no, I mean, that's incredible. It 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 yeah. it would never fit the city. Now it's I think it's completely different because of my generation. But uh, fewer cars. It, it, yeah, it, fewer, but not th- there's a lot of traffic I'm, here. I'm surprised by how just how much people use cars to get yeah. around the city, which just seems perfect for biking. Exactly, it's small. Exactly, but wealthy people. 
thinks that bikes are for poor people. Right. Yeah. That's that's a mindset here. And it's we crazy. have that joke that uh, people from Santos even go to the bakery uh, one with, block with down own. with a car. Right. I, I, yeah. I, when, once I was, it was like 2015, no, 2015, yeah. I was riding a bike with uh, uh, heels. High heels. Yeah. And a friend, a, a mother of a friend talked to her and she was making fun saying, what happened to our, our uh, your friend? <laughs> did she get poor or did she lose everything? She's not good at her work because she was riding a bike with heels. Oh my goodness! So, yes, <laughs> yeah. That's a mindset. That's a mindset, yeah. and that uh, and that can change. And the, uh, we also have the joke that uh, when people from Brazil go to Europe or New York, they love to ride the subway. Uh-huh. Yeah. And but here in, in Brazil, Paulo, they don't in São Paulo, but they don't use public transportation here. Yeah. yeah. Um, even though our subway in Sao Paulo is uh, much cleaner and sometimes even better than, than some cities <laughs> in New Europe. York, of the New York, oh, no, absolutely. And, and, absolutely. And, and, and sometimes even even better than some cities in Europe. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and absolutely. It, we, we say it as a joke, but it's a serious joke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, for sure. So what, what they first do is they do a, a white bikes campaign, it's called. And okay. they basically paint bikes that they put back together um, from parts white, and they leave them around the city for people to use for free. And then they start to take direct action by taking over the streets. So they have, you know, hundreds of bicyclists in the the, uh, vehicular lanes, in the car lanes, it's like of a, 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 a guerrilla, a guerrilla. Yeah, guerrilla. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's like for, a promotion. For, yeah, uh, a guerrilla for urbanism, right? That, that's right. And they were also thinking much ahead of us because they um, already had the climate change problem back then in mind, I right? I think that's right. I think that's right. So the biking is one thing, and that's what everybody knows Amsterdam for, and and that really does, you know, people start to bike to school, bike to work, and the whole life Mm -hmm. revolves around bikes. I think the other thing that happens is, simultaneously, there's a squatter movement, and um, very famously, there's a squatter movement in Vondel Park, which is the equivalent of, like, Central Mm -hmm. Park for Amsterdam, where squatters are taking over buildings which are abandoned, and they are fighting with the police. I mean, you can see pictures of people like, you know, throwing buckets of water down on, on the cops. Mm-hmm. And this lasted for months. But what ended up happening was um, the squatters won. And so uh, Amsterdam and some other cities in Holland started to liberalize their squatting laws. And it's changed a little bit in the last couple of decades, but um, not completely. So when I was a, a university student there, I lived, we lived right across the street. My dorm was right across the street from a squat house. And these squat houses were really, really cool. So what you had to do to be able to squat legally is to show that nobody has been in that building Mm -hmm. for a year. And if you can prove that you've been there for a year, you now have the rights to that space. And part of the idea is not to be parasitical, not to be like just taking Mm -hmm. free stuff. Mm -hmm. So these squatter houses, like on Saturday morning, I'd wake up to like kids screaming in the street because the squatter houses would roll out huge sheets of paper, block the street, and they'd give kids like paint supplies. And this was like a public space. There would space. be some mm-hmm. give back. Of course. Mm-hmm. So there was you know art shows all the time. And these art shows were mm-hmm. you know basically free. You On weekends, we would go party in these spaces where there was music and the drinks were at cost. So they weren't making a profit. You could have food a couple nights a week that they would cook for people mm-hmm. at cost. So what happened here is that Amsterdam, and again, the laws have changed a bit, and we can talk about why that is, but what happened is that Amsterdam had the most affordable housing in Western Europe. And that is strange Mm -hmm. because it's such a small city. Talking about scarcity, Mm -hmm. there's a scarcity of apartments, but they were able to keep rents down for two big reasons. One is squatting. So if you are afraid, that if if you're wealthy and you've got a spare apartment, that you use for, and this is pre-Airbnb, but you use for, you know, renting mm-hmm. out or whatever. Well, if that could be squatted, well, that's a disincentive to have your apartment empty. And so what happened is that apartments started to be used for people who actually needed to needed live in the apartments, it. which is yeah. the point of apartments, is not to speculate on them to make more money in the future, but so people can have a place to live. So I bet 
there are people that will talk that we are communists after hearing <laughs> yeah. this. I bet. I'm waiting for a comment here, guys. Well, and Go I think, ahead, do and, it. And okay, I think do we it. can talk. And if you want, we can bring it back later to MST and Brazil. Yeah, and yeah. Because I think that that's important to put this in context of what's happening with MST and, and draw the parallels. But what happened was, is it's not just, um, oh, I'll get back to the, I'll talk about the second reason in a sec, but it wasn't just that they speak, there was a squatting movement in apartments, but squatters um, also squatted big warehouses, buildings that could be used for places like uh, workspaces. And so what happened is, um, I have a friend, for example, she graduated college in Holland, and, and all these things kind of, you need to have a, a complete picture of how to do this. So she graduates college in Holland without any debt. So one thing you got to do is you got to make college more accessible and affordable. Yeah. She then gets a, a, an interest-free loan from the Dutch government, which is, again, mm -hmm. pretty great. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's a conservative Dutch government. So speaking of communism, right? I mean, this is a, the last 20 years have been a conservative Dutch government. Uh, an interest-free loan for students or people who just graduate. And she creates a business called Oh My Bag, which is now like such a hot brand both in, in Europe but also in the United States. They make wonderful um, fair trade leather purses, leather bags. And she got... Uh, was able to, with the government's help, have an office in a, a squatter office. And what they do is, it's anti-squatter office, what they do mm -hmm. is they give people rent for like 200 euros a month for mm -hmm. a big office mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. Because if the space was empty, it would be squatted. And so this, what this mm -hmm. does okay. is this puts pressure on the state mm -hmm. to fill the space. Mm -hmm. So squatting was this way to always keep pressure, downward pressure on prices. The other thing that's important about Amsterdam is that 90% of the housing stock is um, not publicly owned, but owned by trusts, nonprofit mm -hmm. trusts, which take care of the land. So it's very difficult in the center of Amsterdam to actually own mm -hmm. the ground, the space that mm -hmm. you know, the, you can own the building, okay. but you can't own the ground. And what this does is this, and this has been liberalized some, but this has made it difficult again for people to speculate uh, on housing. Mm -hmm. And in the last 20 years, there's been a rollback of squatter rights and a liberalization of private property. And, you know, rents have, not surprisingly, gone way up. But just to come back to Brazil, could you look and, and could you take the Amsterdam model and apply it here to a, to a city? You know, I'm, I'm not sure you could do it without changing a whole lot of other policies, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's also not impossible to do. And I think that the the recipe is is there. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's a great story that I never heard about it. And I honestly, it's something that I criticize myself because every time we, we want to learn about cities, urbanism, and et cetera, a lot of American authors pop up. and. In creative economy, that's absolutely what happens. But we try to find some European articles. And it, it's crazy because we try to replicate here in Brazil some American models that didn't work, right? right? right. So uh, I think this is the mindset. I criticize myself because I find Jane Jacobs before finding Rita Caldera, for example, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, other... Mm -hmm maybe any other authors from Brazil that I never heard of because I find, I, I didn't find uh, Jane Jacobs. Do you know, I, I, I need to, to say this. Uh, I had like um, a really dilemma in my head <laughs> yeah. because I said, who you admire? And, and I, I pop up a list and I, the list was only composed by men. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. said, Oh my God, what are the women leaderships about innovation, about mm -hmm. city thing, about technology? And I can, I, I, it was like kind of hard to find. And the, the first, first author that I went deeply into the city and common spaces and public spaces was Ray Oldenburg. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. I love his book. He's mm -hmm. amazing. And Jane Jacobs' name popped up in his book for the first time, but I kind of ignored like this, say, okay, Jim Jacobs. And after that, going deeply and deeply in Richard Florida work that talks about a lot of creative economy, I find that Jane Jacobs was his mentor. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I don't need to, to look at him, I need to look at her. Yeah. And then I find Jane Jacobs. Yeah. You find through a Brazilian, I find Jane Jacobs through uh, two men. Yeah. But 
all of them are American. Yeah. So yeah. we need to read all the other books that what Adriano said a lot, other stories. And other... expand our repertoire, right? Yeah. Uh, Not one only thing for... that, that really popped in my head when you were talking about the squatting is that um, that housing solution also uh, helped up building a community, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what do you think that is the relationship between um, uh, where people live, where people work, where people have fun, and building a community uh, that steps through all of those um, of those spaces? Well, I, a great question. I want to, I think it's maybe to step back to Jacobs for a sec and talk about, an, so Jacobs' vision is small, peopled, mm -hmm. peopled spaces. Not small people, but small no, yeah, yeah, yeah. people spaces. Scale. 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 People. Squares are really important, places to gather, yeah. public squares. But if you look at what's happened to the village since Jacobs was writing, the village is not accessible for mm -hmm. people like me. I'm a, I'm a teacher, I uh, work for the city. Um, we're, we're middle class, um, and we could never in a million years afford um, not to live. I mean, we could never dream about living in the village. But, you know, even to, to consume in the village, to shop in the village, it's, it's too expensive for us. So I guess the point is that you can have a Jane Jacobs vision, but without making major changes in society mm -hmm. it can be it, it becomes a space just for the super rich and so mm -hmm. in a way she's a starting point but it's not the end point point. and so mm -hmm. to answer the question about you know community i think the thing we want to think about with cities is what you know what do people need in a community they need i would say they need first and foremost affordable housing and you know it's, that's probably why so many the, the first need is, is is being sheltered, and that's why so many European cities decommodify shelter after World War II. I mean, I think to go back to sort of why Europe is, in some ways, even when it's there's countries which are led by conservatives, why so much of Europe is social democratic. You know, Europe is um, in in 1910 more unequal than the United States is today. It was more unequal than the United States was at the beginning of the 20th century. Europe looks like, I just saw these numbers last night, in terms of the Gini coefficient, which measures mm -hmm. income or wealth distribution. Mm -hmm. That Santos is getting worse in the Gini coefficient in the last two or three years. Something, yes. it's really important, something really important to say. And, and you know, famously, Brazil is yeah. very high, has mm -hmm. a very high Gini coefficient. Um, one of the highest in the world the only places that have high, well, it's the highest democracy in the world and places that have higher Gini coefficients than Brazil are like Qatar. So mm -hmm. these are in the Middle East. These, mm -hmm. This is a very unequal society. Um, and again, we can sort of talk about why that is, but how does Europe go from being very unequal to being a place where you've decommodified things mm -hmm. like housing? And one of the things that happened in the post-war period is the question was, how do we make sure we never go through that again. Mm -hmm. That meaning Hitler. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that people aren't so desperate that they turn to dictators? And at the same time, in the background was how do we make sure, because, you know, if you look at Italy or you look at a place like France, the Communist Party is either the first or second biggest party in both those countries. Mm -hmm. Big Communist parties. Communist parties all over the continent. Not much in England. And the question is, how do we make sure people don't go to that? In other words, mm -hmm. how do we make sure that people don't run to the extremes, to mm -hmm. the fascist side or the communist mm -hmm. side? And what we have to do is make sure that their basic needs are met. And mm -hmm. so this is where you get universal health care, government sponsored mm -hmm. health care. This is where you get the decommodification of housing. And they're not calling it communist. What they're saying is we actually want to avoid communism. Mm -hmm. So and this is one of the most successful policy projects in you know maybe in history where you're able to you know Europe today is I remember being on the train with my father I think it was 20 years ago we were in Amsterdam in, in Holland on the train and we were looking for the countryside it's so beautiful and he was saying you know at any other time in history you go back 70 years Europe was at war Europe has been at war with itself since well we can go back to the crusade right? yeah. 1095 <laughs> right so a thousand years of war this is the first time in modern history Europe's not been at war with itself and a big part of that is that they said, look, if we do this again, we're going to have we have the weapons to end 
civilization. We have nuclear weapons mm -hmm. now. Let's not do that. And so... And also, how many times can we rebuild it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, losing people, losing yeah. children, and losing our own uh, human and material and assets, right? Yeah, and and in our history, That's right? right? And so I think just like, to go back to this question of like, can Brazil do it? Well, Europe was just as unequal as Brazil is today, mm -hmm. just about. Brazil's actually a little bit more unequal yeah. today, just about. Mm -hmm. And they made both the left and the right figured out, center left, center right figured out how do we how do we make our communities livable? So first yeah. thing is decommodification of housing, give people a chance to live affordably. One place also, if you want to look at a beautiful model that still exists today, is look at um, Vienna. Mm -hmm. Vienna has mm -hmm. beautiful public housing. Mm -hmm. And not only is the architecture gorgeous, but you know there's pools. And mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is that the public housing is um, mixed. So you don't have to be low income to live mm -hmm. in the public housing. Mm -hmm. and, and you actually find this in Amsterdam as well. What that means is that doctors are living next door to teachers who are living next door to the unemployed. Mm -hmm. And it means <coughs> that the city or the state takes care of the public housing because it's not just for the poor. So you're not concentrating poverty and you're not creating these islands of poverty mm -hmm. uh, where the poor you know, like don't have a lot of leverage on, on the state or on politics. So. There are really smart, innovative things which have existed for over 70 years, and we have to copy them. So to answer the question, housing, you got to give people access to free or very cheap health care mm -hmm. in their community. Make that accessible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got to make public transportation accessible, cheap, or free. You can't do what Paris has done, which is you basically create these ghettos on the outside of the city and you don't allow trains to mm -hmm. run at night or trains to even reach the periphery. Mm -hmm. You've got to make it accessible. Um, I'm shocked a little bit by how little public transportation, you know, Brazil has, but America's the same. You go to most mm -hmm. American cities besides yeah. New York and it's trains shut down at midnight and there's like five lines, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is a, another way, but also putting money and resources into education, mm -hmm. giving people schools in their community. So, mm -hmm. These things are not disconnected. So I'm like, what makes a good community? I think, you know, there's this, this new idea. It's not even that new, but you hear this phrase a lot. The 15-minute city. Mm -hmm. That everything should be within 15 minutes of where you live. That's a good good start, I think. Yeah. This, this, this theory is amazing. But something that I must say that I was also shocked. It was last... Uh, last week that I find out that the right wing, the conservatives, are creating a fanfic mm -hmm. to the 15-minute city <laughs> yeah. that's saying that, hey, take a look at this, because they want to be build prisons through this concept. And uh, that, that's, I, I won't say this name because I, I don't want to give like a spot for crazy people here, mm -hmm. but there is a, a really famous author that is from conservative wing that is saying this kind of thing so i was looking for the the i, I was looking for a video about uh smart cities and this popped out that the guy was criticizing this and th they always uh do that from a place of uh inputting fear yeah in in people yeah. in putting yeah. insecurities and and working out those insecurities so we are always scared yeah. right and I think the it's link, a culture of fear, right? It is a culture of fear. And I think the link to being trapped inside of your apartment yes. and watching television. And consuming and buying yeah. and buying everything that comes, uh, I, I don't know, from, from the Internet. Yeah. And you get on your front door and you don't even step out to buy, I don't know, fruit or things that are produced uh, right in your neighborhood, right? That's right. I, I want to say, to add something, Lev, that uh, you, you would talk about... This, this, this last moment about real estate and housing. So I've heard something really great in your podcast that I didn't knew that it's 60% of the capital of the world is invested in real estate. More than a half of the capital of the world is invested in real estate and 75% it's about housing. So it's, it was something that it's obvious, but it's really nice when we see data, right? It's like um, if real estate is like this big uh, asset, financial asset, it becomes like a big way to influence power. 
Yes, right? Yes. So uh, it it like um, I, I would love to hear what you say about that. And the other thing, it's really great for you to comment that it's the land itself doesn't have any value if it's not related to the infrastructure, the cities and the lands that are around that. So it's kind of virtual if we think about the concept of <laughs> cities, right? Yeah. It's, it's crazy. So yeah. I would love to hear you talking about that. You know, I think what's interesting is if, you, if you, you've been to New York and if you've been to Dumbo, um, mm -hmm. you have these, Dumbo is a huge tourist attraction where you have these old warehouses, brick warehouses, beautiful, you know, 19th century, early 20th century warehouses. Um, and, and these were factories or warehouses, and they are now um, food courts or shopping yeah. centers. Time out. Right. Time, Time out. out. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that's interesting is if you go to Lisbon, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You go to Baltimore, it's mm -hmm. the same thing. Um, L.A., London, D.C., these are all places where I've gone, and it's exactly the same food hall. It's in an old warehouse or factory. And one of the things that's happened is that as we've moved away from an economy where people make stuff to an economy where so much of the money is going, the capital is, is in finance, insurance, and real estate. They call it the fire economy, finance, insurance, and real estate. Mm -hmm. If you look at what is growing And then, of course, in some places, technology, mm -hmm. like Silicon Valley. But if you look at what's growing fastest in a place like New York, it's the finance sector, which is, mm -hmm. you know, Wall Street. It's insurance, like AIGs, big big firms, insurance firms that most of us don't think about, right, very much. But they're huge. Yeah. And they make, they're the backbone of the economy. Yeah. If you don't have insurance companies, yeah. you can't drive, you can't open up schools. Nothing. You can't have mm -hmm. trucks come from Florida with the food. Nothing mm -hmm. works without insurance. Planes don't fly. And then real estate. And I think so. I think part of what's happened is that so much capital is gone into real estate because capital is looking for a place to go. And if you're not building factories anymore, well, then, you know, let's put our money into something speculative like Bitcoin or the stock market, which is yeah. way overvalued right now, or some place like like real estate. And so you turn. Yeah. This is amazing. I'm, I'm thinking about the video I saw from the new pencil buildings close to, to Central Park. Yeah. <laughs> that the guys, the, the owners, uh, people buy a, a hundred million apartment yeah. and never go there. Well, that's right. And you can walk on Central Park. What's amazing with all these buildings in Central Park is you walk at night and they're they're dark. Because yeah. the people who mm -hmm. live there aren't actually, I'm sorry, people who own the apartments aren't living there. These are, they're parking there. They've never been there. Yeah. It's not people that are not going. they never yeah. been. They make a pix. You know what a pix is? I do, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> they make a pix of a hundred million dollars. After the and never, they, ne they never go there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's because where else are you going to park your money? So you have to think about these as, you know, big storages, empty storages for, for people's capital. So I think that's why you get the number you get. And it's why I, I think that the model of however you do it, you've got to think about how do we make it harder to make a profit in real estate? And then you someone might turn around and say, well, okay, if it's not real estate, what's it going to be? And I think one of the other interesting things I've discovered in my podcast for the last few years is that there is underinvestment in green technology. There are so many technologies that are almost that are almost there, but there isn't the kind of money. I mean, if you look at, you know, let's say it's one and a half trillion dollars right now in cryptocurrency. Literally, cryptocurrency is useless except to speculate on. This is capital that should be going to green technologies. Mm -hmm. Things, for example, like trapping carbon in the atmosphere. So you could in a, a wiser world, you could divert some of that capital or lots of the capital that's going to speculative things and start to put it into things that we need to continue life on the planet, um, which would give people actual jobs and would be good for us. Mm -hmm. So there's no there's no reason in capitalism you have to have such a skewed economy like this. And Sao Paulo is the same story. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be up to policymakers to try to find solutions to decommodify. I'll give you... One example, I grew up in 
Um, and I, we sent you a podcast the other day that, that from a guy, a guy I talked to um, who's a, a Cornell professor of law, but he had this idea of, of how do you take property out of the market? And what he said is, look, you, and this is what the community was like where I grew up in the Bronx, grew up in this community where the labor unions bought the land and they own the land. Think about the public trust I was talking about in Amsterdam for a sec. You as an individual can buy your apartment mm -hmm. in, in this village, and it was mm -hmm. in the Bronx, and you buy it for, say, $15,000. Mm -hmm. When you sell it in 20 years or whenever you sell it, you sell it for the same as you bought it for. Mm -hmm. Maybe they give you interest on it or maybe not. Okay. In other that's, words, that's on contract. Yeah. In other okay. words, you cannot make a profit off of the land, okay. off okay. of the apartment. Okay. So what that does is it allows people to live in, you know, very affordable rents. This was for middle class. This is basically a lot of people who work mm -hmm. for the city, middle class in housing, um, beautiful apartments by Van Cortlandt Park. And you can't speculate on this property. You could use this model across the United States. You could use it in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And this would be a way to shift capital towards better uses and make housing more mm -hmm. affordable. True, true innovation. That That's what I always mm -hmm. say. Like the real estate thing, we need to build our offices, our houses. But the real estate as usual, it's the completely opposite of innovation. Absolutely. Because it's like... Uh, Bricks, bricks are not innovative, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Even it's like a green technology or etc. There's they are bricks, right? The the money is stuck. They don't move through better things, mm -hmm. better life, better causes, it's a better product. Yeah, exactly. And and sorry to say, I mean, no offense to rich people, but rich people yeah, are exactly. not the ones creating culture. And so what For, you see or in, innovation. No, right, exactly. And so if you look at New York right now, New York is unaffordable for. For the artists, for the creators, Perfect. for the innovators, yeah. and people are moving to places like you know Nashville in Tennessee uh -huh. because you can you can afford Austin, some, Austin, Austin, you can afford, it, and now you can't even afford rent in Austin. Yeah, right? so, <laughs> so the, because that's a movement that happens. Exactly, the, 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 the gentrification starts to spread like from one city to another, right? That's right. And you have the migratory movement too that we need yeah. to talk. We, we need to talk a lot, lot about a lot of things yet here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but I think that the, the problem is. And so in Brooklyn, you know, you know, I grew up in New York, and there's a lot of people who grew up in New York who look at these out-of-towners coming in, gentrifying, and the, I actually think they're the wrong target. Like, it's not their fault that they're looking for an affordable place to live in New York City. So it, this has to be policymakers who make these changes. But to go back to Amsterdam, policymakers are only going to go as far as people push. Okay. And in that sense, people have to become activists. And one thing, mm -hmm. it happens in New York a couple times a year, but it's not enough, is that thousands of bicyclists take over the streets mm -hmm. for one day. It's just mm -hmm. not enough. Mm -hmm. What has to happen every day is civil disobedience where mm -hmm. people are taking over the streets, retaking the streets from cars. Taking it back. Taking right. it back. As Jane Jacobs is. That's right. Um, <laughs> we were talking about the innovation in real estate, and I think Ludmila wants to bring up uh, the thing about the lottery, the, the, the housing lottery, housing lottery yeah. that uh, Amanda, your wife, told us about. And we would like to uh, let our audience know uh, your experience and what is the housing lottery. It's an, an innovative project to provide uh, affordable housing for people in New York. It's, New it's York, not new, right? but it's innovative. It's, and, 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 and many, many people, people don't know, know about it. Yeah. Many people don't know about it. In New York as well, um, we found out about it from a friend. Um, and we just, it was, we were lucky. Uh, what it is, is that you, if you meet the income requirements, um, so it's, it's really for working class people uh, like us, um, if you meet the income requirements, um, then you can put together a ton of docs. Gotta say, the process is actually hard and we can talk about this also and the sort of ways to streamline it or make it better i think it's too hard for, for most people yeah. mm -hmm. it takes a lot of a lot of time and it ends up uh shutting some people that really need to give it up out. Yeah. exactly um you, you need to have first of all you need to have a, an income a job 
Mm -hmm. um, and so people who need this most, <laughs> who may be unemployed, you can't even think about Are applying. Shut up. You, you have to have some, you have to have some, they want to make sure there's some security there. So in any case, you apply and then you look at the one website and this is, the website's great. It shows you apartment buildings across the city that are generally brand new buildings, often luxury buildings. So the building we are in is a luxury building. The market rate rent is two or three times, depending on the size of the apartment, what we pay. There's a pool. I mean, there's also two wonderful things about the building. It's right on the, on the river. Um, and if you get a good lottery number, you can apply to as many as you want. Mm -hmm. And if you qualify, if you get a good lottery number, they call you to come look at the mm -hmm. space. And then there's some more vetting. And then you can move into this place. So and we, the thing is, we have to explain that uh, the constructors have to uh, set aside yeah. Uh, a couple of of units, right? Right. Well, actually, more than a yeah. percentage, so, a percentage of units. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, for that program. It's between twenty and thirty percent. Okay. So twenty or thirty percent of of a new building that's being uh, made in New York yeah. has to be uh, set aside for uh, that program, right? right? Okay. Now, so in return, the city gives huge tax rebates to the developers. Okay. In the last decade. Um, the city gave developers $10 billion dollars worth of rebates. So to, to, just to be clear, we're very happy we live where we live. But I think so when we when you when we talk about the first question was, what do I think of Brazilian cities? And I think the answer is always like the old joke, like, you know, two old ladies are talking and one says to the other, how's your husband? And she says, compared to what? <laughs> how, how do we how do we compare Brazilian cities? Like, what are we comparing them to? If you compare Brazilian cities to New York, I mean, New York looks really progressive. But when I talk to European friends about the lottery, they're like, man, America's really messed up. They make people apply for a lottery to get a good house. So <laughs> I, I think, you know, rich people here, my understanding from Amanda, would fight to the nail against allowing 20% of people in their luxury buildings to be middle class or working class. The, the fight in New York is, you know, I, I so I mean, yes, it's exciting to have 20% for people like us. Um, It needs to be, this is not the solution. It needs to be much greater. But even then, a lottery is not really the, sol the solution to our to our housing crisis. Um, you know, I think anywhere. But I'm happy we I'm happy we have it. Yeah. I think it's a start. Um, there are some there are some problems with it. You know, most of these buildings, there's something called the poor door. So I, I was exactly <laughs> going to to ask for because there there are there are some similar stuff in São Paulo. So it's innovative, because you know. But even if it's innovative, it it doesn't mean it's a hundred percent good, right? So absolutely. So there are many buildings which you know give people substandard services. Still great to live in these buildings, but you know you really do feel like you're like lucky and you're a guest to live there, and that's not. That's not ideal. Mm -hmm. But I think another way to think about it is what could, speaking of innovation, what could an innovative city do with $10 billion? Mm -hmm. That's revenue we've lost. Mm -hmm. And I think you could get a whole lot better than 20 or 30 percent of the apartments in, in these buildings. Uh -huh. So there were things like Mitchell Lama in the 1960s. Mitchell Lama, they were, it was you know, two legislators in New York State. Mm -hmm. And Mitchell Lama housing was housing like the housing that I grew up in which was, you know, cooperatives. Okay. It's not public housing, but you're not going to make a profit off the apartment. And they stopped building Michelama housing. This, the people who live in Michelama today are, there's a waiting list for, for the waiting list to Michelama. There's <laughs> great demand for Michelama. You could do this yeah. again. But the answer over the last 40 years has been, let's let the private sector solve our problems. Oh, yeah. And the private sector is not going to solve the problem of The private sector is not going to solve the problem of housing. And uh, the public problems, because they want to make money, right? Exactly. It's, it's that simple. It's yeah. not a mystery why we don't yeah. have. And, and the private sector, talking about the real estate state, yeah. the private sector has captured the government. So the mayor of yeah. New York, the governor of New York, mm -hmm. they get lots of money from the real estate sector. Mm -hmm. I mean, look who the last president of the United States was mm -hmm. before Biden. He was from real estate. Real estate is very powerful. 
Listen, um, there's something so obvious that I've yeah. never thought about Trump Tower, right? Yeah. It's not Trump that runs the USA. It's the Trump Tower, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So how do you reduce the power of real estate? And then this gets into more radical suggestions. Like you have to, well, change the democratic process. You have to somehow make barriers between capital and politics. I mean, all these things are mm, yeah. deep problems. The cities don't change without changing those problems. Yeah. Now. That's... We are making one minute of silence yeah. for the capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> Rest in peace, silence. planet yeah. Earth. Okay, go. <laughs> we, are, we are hopeful. So, uh, get we have to end this episode <laughs> on a, on on a, a hopeful, hopeful note. I'm trying. Okay. I do my best. On a happy note. I don't no, know if it's please. in my constitution. <laughs> but I'm from New York. We don't do, we don't do happy. <laughs> yeah. Santos is a happy place. <laughs> Not so happy. <laughs> they're, they're becoming New well, I'm York. Look, I'm looking at your shirt, though, right? I mean, yeah. this, is the, this is the kind of shirt you'd never see in New York. <laughs> it's not the kind of thing New York person would have. use. <laughs> no, no, I love... I, this, oh, I, I must say something. These shirts are inspired kind of in Milt, Milton Glaser <laughs> works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. So that's the guy who set up I Love New York during the 70s, that New York is in a, in a huge crisis. But it's another episode content. So, <laughs> Lev... You are amazing, Thank and you. we have a lot of conversation to have here. But okay. I, Flavia, got the lottery thing, uh, and I want to talk about gentrification. Something that I was hearing also at your podcast is that kids in New York and teenagers, really young, know the words gentrification. Yeah. And I just knew this word at 30 or 35 because our cities are different. As Adriano yeah. said, there's no gentrification in Brazil. So what do you have to say about gentrification and tell people that hear us, what is gentrification? So and how does it deal with your life? Well, right. So like the, the root of gentrification, the, the idea is it comes from this, the term gentry, like the landed gentry, the, the wealthy. And it's when, you know, today we use the term when you have a formerly working class space city Mm -hmm. which becomes unaffordable to the working classes um and so usually you know first it's the artists who move in and after Mm -hmm. that it's the coffee shops and from there you know you get expensive restaurants and and um the person maybe to to read for this in new york and he's got a great blog is jeremiah moss his blog is called um vanishing new york he has a book called vanishing new york and what he does is he shows all these old school places which disappear and Mm. so um it's it's great he really is documenting what's happening i i have a book about this that's about the uh, not the specific places but the 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 facades is how you the say facades, facades. facades yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's a guy that photograph all this vintage and really traditional places that are vanishing but only the <laughs> the facade yeah it's really pretty it's it's a poetic work I would it's love amazing. to see that it's incredible he, he describes I forget if it's in his book on the block but he describes this street um, Bergen Street in Brooklyn mm-hmm. this one block and these new condos have gone up skyscrapers and on the block, you have a <clears throat> sex uh, toy shop. Mm-hmm. You've got a lingerie shop. You've got a <clears throat> woman's pregnancy mm-hmm. clothing shop. <laughs> this evolution. <laughs> you've got a bar. <laughs> you've got a bar. Um, and you've got a children's bookshop. Okay. And what he said was all of that came in together planned by real estate. Mm-hmm. What you're doing is you're giving folks from the suburbs. So he famously says the, the, the people who went to the suburbs hurt New York twice. First by leaving to go to the suburbs and they took the mm-hmm. tax base with them. And then their kids returned. Mm-hmm. And what their kids do yeah. is their kids want suburbia when they come mm-hmm. back. Yes. But to go back, I think the just to repeat myself a little bit, um, or at the risk of repeating myself, the I think Jeremiah Moss is great, but the problem is not that people want good coffee shops. It's the problem is not the individuals who want this experience. The problem is the policy. Mm-hmm. So, yes, gentrification is a huge deal. I'm not mad at the gentrifiers. And so when you talk about s- students in New York, yeah, they all know about gentrification. Yeah. But they're like, they're mad at the people who are in their neighborhoods who are wearing flip-flops and come from Idaho. But you can't be mad at these people. Yeah. They need to, they want to experience yeah. New York too. They need to work and they yeah. need to find some place, you know, affordable i think on the con- the question of facades i think it's a great way to talk about authenticity because 
what has happened in, if we go back to those old warehouses, is those spaces are supposed to look like authentic urban spaces, but it, 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 inside is, you know, J. Crew and Time Out New York. Mm-hmm. So the, the image is one of authenticity, yeah. but the, the reality is that it, that's not there. Mm-hmm. And so I think having a conversation about what a truly authentic city looks like is an important one. It's a democratic conversation. It's hard to do if mm-hmm. these other yes. barriers exist. It's, it's like an edited version of the city, right? <laughs> it is. Uh, yes. It's edited to fit the expectations, yeah. to fit the policies. It's edited Clean, to be... Clean, hygienistic, uh, yeah. and stuff. And, uh, and know, to look good on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, Lev, do you know Ailton Krenak, author in Brazil? No. He's like uh, a An guy, indi- uh, indigenous, indigenous author. author and philosopher. And he says something really great that's related to what Flavia just said, that we are you Use it to uh, free samples of the world. Mm. It, that's his quote, something like this. Mm. Like, okay, you UNESCO come and say this is heritage. But just get this and product, buy this, and we get happy seeing like a uh, mm-hmm. sample. Like it's uh, mm-hmm. a, a mostra gratis. Yes. As, and, and it's yeah. something like crazy because in Brazil, we have a guy that, do, do you know Vaio Davan? Have you heard about this guy? No. It's like a really conservative entrepreneur that uh, was matching with Bolsonaro. Mm -hmm. And in his store, it's called Avan. Avan. Avana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But he and puts, all, all the stars have like a, uh, a statue of liberty on the front, front in the front, the replica <laughs> of the statue yeah. of liberty. Yeah. And, and he's like USA <laughs> lover and etc. So it, it's it it's, it's explained that an authenticity, an authenticity mm-hmm. that this kind of things that the 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 middle class, the the average citizen doesn't think about it. Yeah, right? that's that's. A, big problem we That's have here, like the, the critical thinking about this kind of signs and stuff. Absolutely. I just to say one more yeah. thing um, about the editing of the cities. Yeah. It, the important thing about when your public space is not really public space, it means that you can edit out the poor. Mm-hmm. And so by, you know, poor people The mall is not public. It feels yes. public. We're told to think it's mm-hmm. public. But if you are a homeless person and you come into the mall, you can be escorted out. Yeah. Yeah. In New York. And even if you don't have like uh, the the money to buy a coffee or yeah. to buy an ice cream. That's right. You can't go in. That's if right. you are black. And if, if you're, you're black. Are not well um, dressed. If you, yeah. You, if you're riding flip flops, you can't yeah. go in. That's Just right. if you are black, because if you're using flip flops and, and you're white, white and you are blonde, that's okay. She's cool, right? Yeah, yeah, that's bad in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're going to. to oh, I was just going to say, like yeah. you know, along with the along with the malls, it's. You know, they have what they call like bum proof benches, which the benches are curved. They look mm-hmm. like a barrel mm-hmm. or they are like the size of this this desk, mm-hmm. but there are two blocks. So you mm-hmm. can't lie down mm-hmm. on the benches. They make the public art- architecture as uncomfortable as possible. So, yeah. again, people don't stay. Yeah. And I think um, this question of built space, the design of built space could be such a cool episode for you guys. Probably you've done one already, but I think it could be a really cool one. One thing I think about a lot is if you look at, you know, Trump's building on 59th Street, Columbus Circle in New mm-hmm. York, it's this it's this gigantic skyscraper, which is totally black. In other mm-hmm. words, there's tinted windows. Mm-hmm. And one of the things you see, I think, in an unhealthy city space are buildings with tinted windows because Mm -hmm. it is it's surveillance and it's not letting you see what's going on in Mm -hmm. here. But we can see what goes on out there. Mm -hmm. And Brazil, it was always surprising about Brazil is that Brazil's got a lot of that. I even see it with the cars here. Cars, not just Mm -hmm. on the side, have dark tinted windows, but on the front Mm -hmm. window is tinted. And it really does give one the impression that it's this panopticon that Foucault talks about where you feel like you're always being watched. You better behave well. Mm -hmm. You never know when you could be being watched. Mm -hmm. But it's not a human being that's actually watching you. But you're also always alone. You're also always alone. That's right. And so... To go back to how do I feel about Brazil, I remember in, in 2008, I came back to Sal- I went to Salvador for a little while and I had a ticket to stay for a couple months. I was with some friends there and I left after three weeks and I got so it was a bad point in my life. I got so depressed 
by the spaces that I was in. And it's like, you know, the beach until dark, then a mall. Mm -hmm. And then at night, mm -hmm. there's a bar, which international people go to and wealthy Brazilians. And these are the people that you're meeting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the problems about lots of wealthy people everywhere, but here in particular, is that they were fascist. And so you end up hanging out with fascist mm -hmm. people that you would never dream of hanging out with in New York. And it's just kind of like, all right, this is like heartbreaking and not the space, you know, that I want to be. Yeah. And just to say it doesn't it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, and, and, and Salvador, you, you went there in 80s or 90s? No, no, I went there in 2002, oh, and I went again in 08. Yeah. Okay, okay, I lived in Salvador when I was a kid. Okay. It, and it, like, it's a huge metropolis full of violence, and I, I grew up like in a car. So mm -hmm. that's why I felt the difference that what I felt when I came to Santos, where, uh, where I was a teenager that could walk alone for school. Yeah. So it's like freedom. Yeah. It's, it's something crazy because Salvador was crazy. I don't know how it is right now, but it's a metropolis, car driven, mm -hmm. things far away, condos. And we have like housing, condo housings. I have really well friends that live there. So we need to enter a place with a lot of credentials to go in. But there are a lot of houses for people to feel safe. Yes. And safe is like an illusion That's in right. Brazil. It's completely yeah. an illusion. That's right. <laughs> the cars, the, the, the dark thing is like an illusion for safety here. Yeah. So it's great. But I need to ask you something about to end. Positively. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't know what we'll you're going to goes. say. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, um, since you are a teacher, yeah. it's really important to us to talk about education. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what this, the last fl question Flave uh, would do, but I would love to hear you. Uh, how do you think the education impacts the city? This is important for us to know from you. Yeah, I think there's, that's a big question. <laughs> um, well, I think... For urban planners in New York, okay, so let's, you go back to New York in the 1990s, it's a mess, as we've talked about. Tax base is gone, a lot of wealthy people have moved out of the city, a lot of wealthy people have their kids, people who remain in the city keep, keep their kids in private school. You know what that's like here, kids are in private school, if you have any kind of money. So the city is trying to figure out, how do we bring back the capital? How do we get people to come back to New York? And the creative class, the people who work in finance, yeah. and, and one of the things that they do is they create a a small school model where you break up the big schools and sometimes they're called magnet schools. The idea is they attract people, but you sometimes they're called less generously boutique schools, okay. which is you're creating a public school, but the public school is very, very good. Um, you don't have the kids for the most part take the state exams. So you're not teaching to the tests and you are basically training a managerial class. Um, and managerial class doesn't want their kids to do rote learning. They want their kids to be able to think creatively yeah. because they're going to be running the world. And so what happens is you got these model schools for a very small percentage of the people in the city. And these schools are fantastic. And everybody applies to these schools and, um, you know, few people get in. But they, they really do prove or they give lie to the fact that public education can't work because it can when you put the resources yeah. in. Yeah. And, and you've got a vision which is... Um, more democratic, less test based, and it's uh, the the term that you know is used a lot is inquiry based. In other words, you give people a question, mm -hmm. and then you give the kids a chance to go research that question, and you don't pretend you have the answer to the question because yeah. none of us do. And you say, "All right, let's look into this together," and then you look into it and you say, "Let's keep going." Because now it brings up some more questions. That's the inquiry model. That model is impossible in uh, a kind of schooling uh, where, you know, you have to pass the state test. And so if you could if you could build more of those schools, which you could, and give everybody access to those schools, which you could, um, well, then I think you'd have like a really different city, a different population. You'd have people who are who are asking big and sometimes, you know, dangerous questions. Mm -hmm. But um, and like obvious questions like so. So oftentimes the answers are just like, like we talked about, like it's about money oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Money captures politics. That's not mm -hmm. like an out there idea. It's not even a communist idea. It's just real. Yeah. Everybody knows it. So um, there are lots of historical reasons why we why we have set up the education system like this. But 
yeah, I think I think it's it's a way to attract people back to the to the neighborhood, and we know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and do, do you do you want to ask? And me? also, you have to provide. Not only you you need to attract, but you have to provide like um, a whole uh, support system for the families. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have to provide places that uh, support uh, breastfeeding. You have to provide places that support. Uh, ch child's play mobility for women mobility, that has more complexities um, um, como é que chama a licença maternidade uh, uh, maternity ooh. leave That's right. yeah. you have to provide all those things and we, we did a story last week uh, about how our city treats our moms and the most uh, the challenges here the, the, the main challenges here are scarcity of daycare and institutions for child care sure. Um, the absence of public spaces that are adapted to children mm -hmm. and our families and lack of support to maternity and breastfeeding and um, the lack of uh, conciliation policies uh, between work and work time and family time. Mm -hmm. um, yes. That's a, v a huge problem in our cities mm -hmm. and in our country. Uh, so we have to um, if we need, need to look to the future, we have to first look at that um, nuclear family and the, and, the, and the single moms that are so in need yeah. for, for, uh, of support, right, Lev? Yes, it, it, I don't know how much time we have. Um, we, are, we are almost, <coughs> we need to end up, but you, We're you going should to do two parts yeah, right. of oh, this episode. Yeah, so. <laughs> no, I'm not going to come back to Brazil. Do we have five minutes? Yeah, of course. Yes. Oh, so I, so. I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some writing right now and some research. Um, and in the writing and research, I'm coming uh, I'm coming across a lot of material about Brazil in the just directly in the post emancipation period. Mm -hmm. And um, the very very quick story, which I'm sure most listeners already know, but is new for me, is and I think take an example of the Northeast, for example, is that once you get emancipation in Brazil in the late 1880s. You now have the problem of people who have become free now needing to find work. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they are finding work on the very same plantations that they had been working mm -hmm. on for the same people. And so what happens is that not all, but many people leave and they go to hilly or swampy areas just to the south of, of Salvador. And they are setting up these communities which are... Um, non-hierarchical, based on mutual aid, and um, are, are stateless. Mm -hmm. And these communities are um, around for about 70 years. And there's some really interesting anthropologists who are you know, studying these communities. And one of the things that keeps happening in over the course of early 20th century Brazilian history is that the plantation economies keep spreading. And it's as if there's this kind of, in a horror movie, this mm -hmm. monster chasing people, mm -hmm. and they have to keep moving. Mm -hmm. There is then a direct line between these people without land and the landless people who in Brazil today are agitating for some kind of housing rights. I think to take to go back to the MST question, to go to MST is either the scariest thing you've ever heard of because they are, you know, people are taking private property, or it's a solution to an agri agrarian reform that never happened. Mm -hmm. And it's people sort of like the Amsterdam model squ squatting and saying, no, like, look, the state didn't give this to us. The state was captured by big agriculture and has been since emancipation. The same pe the same families, basically. We're going to do this ourselves. And one of the things as I'm looking more into the MST is that not only they're big and tapped into, you know, the PT, for example, but also the mainstream. Right. But they are really organized. And so I think to talk about the things that, uh, that you need, they're saying, okay, it's not just land, but we have to think about things like alcohol. No alcohol is allowed in MST camps. Education. Everybody has to continue education the whole time they're in the camp. And then how do we provide basic health care for families, the basic necessities for families within, within this community that we built? And then thinking of all sorts of things like how do we mm -hmm. make sure that if, you know, you do washing dishes tonight, I do washing dishes tomorrow. In a way, they, it's an anarchist, it's an anarchist experiment 
without calling it anarchism. And that is what, you know, the anthropologist that I spoke to about Bahia in the post-emancipation period was saying, these people are not calling it anarchism, but this is, they're mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to live where, you know, they're, con- they're under constant threat from private property. So to go back to the question of private property, which is, I think, in a way, the big theme of what we've been talking about yeah. today is, who has the right to a city? Who has the right to land? Most societies in the world have been much fairer than we have been in the last 150 years, we Americans and Brazil as well, around private property rights. They've been, we are, we have tightened private property rights to the point where MST folks look like terrorists. When if you take a step back and just look at the recent history of Brazil, it's very clear that the people who made this country never got the land that they that they were owed. Mm-hmm. And this is a way to uh, address that. That's, that's uh, something to reflect. Because every story has the two sides, right? There's yeah. not, there's not, yeah. There, there's not uh, what's how you say this in port in Portuguese. There's no, there's no in, in Portuguese. You say, no existing versões, no existing histórias, existing versões. There's no, you got it. I got it. Okay, totally. you got then, it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, just to finish this, I I would like to. I was really curious, and this is about future and more optimistic. I know your son has a really particular name. Oh, yeah. He's not born yet, but he will be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He will have a particular name. <laughs> yeah. But it's like a city name. Yeah. This is amazing. Just oh, inside. Yeah. Well, just by the way, so we did not. So our son, so our daughter's name is Sel. Okay. Like Sky. Yeah. And um, we actually, there's a lot of people in the United States named Sky. Not, okay. We found mm-hmm. out not in Brazil. Yeah. So every time mm-hmm. we meet people in Brazil and we tell them her name, we're like, <laughs> um, but. Um, we also really like the singer Cell a lot, mm-hmm. and so okay, we were like, yeah. "Okay, why not?" Um, <laughs> our son, uh, we're gonna name him Rio, like the city, but not after the city. We were naming him after River. Okay, that's that's why I'm. Yeah, uh, we we love we love the name River, but we also wanted to give him a Portuguese name as well. Perfect. Um, and and uh, we we haven't done it yet, but we will. The, I think the the interesting thing is gonna be, you know, my last name is Moscow, like the city, mm-hmm. so he's going to be Rio Moscow. <laughs> It is going to be. Well, it is going to be uh, an interesting life for him. Um, uh, but we also hope maybe a geographer. Maybe a geographer. Exactly. Yes. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yes. So and maybe we're going to give him a normal, normal sounding middle name. That if he wants to, we gave Sel a, a normal middle name in okay. case he wants to ever. Um, but my first name is Lev, which is also a not a common American name. It's a Russian name, and um, my parents gave me a, a, a middle name which was more common. And if I chose to use it, I could. So I, we'll, we'll see what they end up choosing to do but um we i was we are not encouraged by the responses we've been getting to rio people are not that you're not happy with the name <laughs> but we're going to go ahead with it anyway and uh, you know we'll see how it goes i love it to have a kid yes. drawing the future with city names this is <laughs> yes. perfect uh, uh, yes Rio Moscow should be in this podcast someday. <laughs> someday yeah, hopefully. yeah. Thirty years from now, yes. Rio, yeah. we are inviting you. <laughs> you yeah, you you're that? going to see this video. <laughs> Lev, it was oh, a pleasure. Thank you and for me too. It was this like, was wonderful. It's amazing. It, it was to to find your story and your content. Uh, we we knew for, I think, since 2019. Mm-hmm. But I did. I I knew her really smart, a teacher, etc. <laughs> but I I didn't knew how deeply you you went into city things. So mm-hmm. I love to have this conversation with you. Yeah, me too. Yes, this was a great talk. Yes, Lev. thank you thank very you. much. Thank you both. Very Hope much. you come back soon oh, yes. to yes. record. <laughs> You're always welcome thank in you. Brazil thank and you very in much. Santos too. Thank, thank you, you Lev. Thank you. Pessoal, quem gostou desse papo, não esquece de deixar o seu... Foi tão intenso que a gente nem pediu aqui o like, né? Mas deixa o seu like ou no YouTube ou nas plataformas, né? O, o, o Leve, ele não é muito de rede social, tá? Mas você pode acompanhar... Say what the name of your podcast. A Correction Podcast. A Correction Pra quem entende inglês, é tudo em inglês. A gente joga lá no Google e a gente vai deixar o link aqui no YouTube, aqui embaixo. E quero agradecer a sua audiência aqui, eu sei que esse conteúdo foi intenso, eu aprendi muito, espero que você tenha gostado. Obrigada, Flávia Saad, que Obrigada está aqui com a minha parte me hoje. E a gente se vê, quem sabe, um outro dia na Autenticidade. É isso. Lisieira, um beijo pra você, espero que você também tenha gostado desse podcast, dessa conversa, e até o próximo Autenticidades. Música